Ludwig Boltzmann in the 19th century introduced some of the most basic ideas in statistical mechanics, giving us the tools that are needed to understand the rules of the macroscopic world, namely the rules of thermodynamics, how they emerge from the rules of the microscopic world. The Boltzmann Medal, which is named in his honor, is given once in three years to noted physicists and uh, mathematicians who have made influential contributions to statistical mechanics. It is a matter of great pride for us that uh, this year's recipient of this prestigious medal is one among us, one of our colleagues, uh, Professor Deepak Dhar. Deepak, uh, thank you for agreeing to give this uh, interview to this ICER Science Media Center. I'm very happy to have this opportunity. I'll say a few words about Deepak's career. Deepak, uh, over his career at Caltech, TIFR, and ICER Pune, has worked on an exceptionally broad range of problems in statistical mechanics, on phase transitions, percolation, dynamics in disordered and stochastic systems, renormalization on fractal lattice models, interfacial growth models, and self-organized criticality, particularly in what are called abelian uh, sandpile models. Deepak has a knack to see exactly solvable scenarios in many of these systems. Uh, Deepak did his undergraduate studies at uh, University of Allahabad and Masters at IIT Kanpur, after which he went to Caltech for uh, his PhD. So Deepak, could you tell us a little bit about how uh, you started your PhD, how, uh, what problems you worked on? While okay, so for my PhD, it was sort of not very easy to find a supervisor because I was kind of fixed in my idea that I want to work on this problem and at that time in Caltech statistical physics was not a very strong subject mm -hmm. and uh, there were very few professors who were interested in working on those kinds of questions. But uh, I found Professor John Matthews whose general uh, sort of approach was that the students should be independent and should you know, should pick the problem themselves and they can discuss with him now and then, once a week really. And uh, he will help them, but he does not provide commands in the beginning. So that was very nice and convenient for both of us. And so I started working on the, some problems by reading up on, you know, whatever is known about the subject. So the problem which was very burning at that time has been since then as well was the problem of phase transitions. So I was interested in trying to find a model of melting of solids. And so in my thesis there were two parts. One part was making a model of melting and the second was one study of renormalization group on fractals. So the model of melting has not been very popular. I guess it was a maturish attempt at understanding a very difficult problem. But anyway, it was sort of saying that you can think of the three-dimensional solid melting as melting of layers. And each layer sits on a periodic potential provided by the substrate. And uh, when the temperature increases, the um, layer will show RMS fluctuations which are much bigger than at lower temperatures. And that is the phase transition. It becomes equivalent to what is called the sine gordon model. And so, you know, that was the thing. It, it's not very good for realistic solids as of now because, you know, that kind of approximation is not very good. But anyway, that was one part of my thesis was to make this model of uh, melting of solids as a system of layers. And one la in the, all the bottom layers are fixed and they provide a periodic potential with the top layer which melts with a function of temperature. The second part was on... Um, uh, renormalization group studies of fractals. So at that time, fractals was quite new since the book of Mendelbrot had only come out in 77. So then there were some papers by Nelson and Fisher and uh, they discussed uh, renormalization on something they called truncated tetrahedron lattice. And uh, I was going to study some simple model on this particular graph and it turns out that it was non-trivial and it gave the spectrum of excitations of the harmonic solid 
on the Sierpinski on this particular truncated tetrahedron lattice gives you a notion of dimension which is different from the usual dimension which is ascribed to it. So, nowadays it is called the spectral dimension, but I had a sort of realize that it is different from the other one and you know discuss these properties. So, that was the second part of my thesis. Different physicists have different ways of uh, elucidating physics in uh, various uh, realistic systems. Uh, your approach seems to be to look at uh, simple lattice models to understand the physics in uh, many of these systems. Could you say a little about how these lattice models connect to realistic systems? Okay, so I think the real world is quite complicated and the point of modeling is to identify the critical features of the system and ignore the inessential details. And so, we come to what is called simplified models where you keep only what you consider are the important features and everything else is lost. So, in particular uh, counting of numbers is easier than integrals. You know you learn how to count in fourth grade, but you do only integrals in 10th <laughs> or 11th. So, to that degree lattice models are easier to study than continuum models. And it turns out that quite often the mathematical techniques are also they can go a little bit further for lattice models than for continuum models. And uh, in the end you can make a model which is well studied you call the Ising model and um, make some predictions about the behavior of um, let us say liquid gas transition. And they are actually verified also in the real experimental systems which are in the continuum. So, some predictions of the lattice models can be continue to hold in the continuum and they are more tractable mathematically if they are on the lattice than in the continuum. So, that is the interest in studying lattice models. So, it is somewhat simpler to study, but captures all the essential features that is the Well, all the essential no, is a matter of uh, subjective judgment, but yeah at the moment you are interested in some features and those are well captured hopefully the in that model. model. Okay. So, uh, you mo moved from Caltech to TIFR in 1978. Uh, uh, the atmosphere in TIFR must have been very different from that at Caltech. So, how did your work change? You had new colleagues and new ways of working. So, did you okay, continue so to work on the same problems? Actually, I did not find it to be awfully different. What used to happen was that at uh, Caltech, I would interact with some friends from various departments and go to these departmental seminars, but was not strongly interacting with various faculty members at that time. So, at TIFR also there were some seminars by eminent people, we were very young and we did not fully understand what was going on, but there were also other young colleagues with whom you could discuss various things and also in different departments. So, it was very nice and, and interesting at that time to be there and I had a lot of friends from that time who have continued to be my friends over 45, 50 years. So, what did you work on when you moved to uh, TIFR initially? Okay, so, I started working with Professor Mustansir Barma. So, he was working at that time on relaxation in magnets. I think he told me about the model, but anyway we discussed it together, Ising model mm -hmm. in one dimension mm -hmm. and time dependent properties thereof. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were studying the case when the, all the couplings are not equal. So, this is called disordered Ising model and it has a rather non-trivial relaxation behavior because the case where all couplings are equal was studied by Glauber in his famous paper. Mm -hmm. But the disordered case is non-trivial. And uh, so, we figured out that you know some old results of leaf sheets would be applicable in this case and we showed that the relaxation is non-trivial and it is stretched exponential mm -hmm. and uh, so that was the beginning of the work. Mm -hmm. Then uh, around 1980, we became interested in directed percolation which was sort of being discussed at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, we wrote some papers on directed percolation and we made some experiments with real diodes and you know soldering them and seeing the connectivity 
how the conductivity varies as a function of concentration of diodes in this problem. And so, it took a lot of time and uh, effort and uh, we had the help of experimental colleagues. Oh, you really did there was a real experiment. We had to write a proposal for funding of the, you know, buying all the <laughs> diodes. It was cost 10,000 rupees at that time, which luckily was available from TIFR local funds. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have to go to DST. Mm -hmm. So, so it was a lot of fun. I, I think uh, it was very hard work because we used to solder the diodes. Some of them will break down after some time. And so, maintaining the network itself used to be a lot of work. Eventually, we found that it's much easier to do it on the computer mm -hmm. because there, if you solder it once, it remains there. <laughs> but anyway, so it was. Uh, so then we. Uh, that was uh, in the beginning. Yes, those were my basic questions: were directed percolation and the relaxation in magnets. You worked a lot on uh, self-organized criticality. Some of your famous works are on uh, exact solutions to. Uh, models of self-organized criticality, in particular sandpile models. Could you tell us what uh, self-organized criticality and what sandpile models are? Okay, so the concept of self-organized criticality was introduced by Pierre Bach in 87 and uh, he noticed that lot of natural systems have what is called fractals. So, they, are, they have long range correlations in behavior. So, like if you look at mountain mm, landscape, mm -hmm. then there is a peak here, but the behavior of the height of the mountain here is correlated with the height at 1000 kilometers away, mm -hmm. right. So, how do these long range correlations come into being? How are the mountains formed and take the particular shape they take? Mm -hmm. That is the kind of question he was interested in. So, all the known models of generating long range correlations in statistical physics used to involve what is called fine tuning in the sense you have to have the temperature very precisely controlled to a part in a million to get long range correlations. But of course, in nature when the mountains were formed the temperature was fluctuating widely, it was not kept at a particular value. And uh, you know in different regions of the world the temperature is at different places, but you still get mountains which look roughly similar. So, the point was that you should be able to generate these long range correlations without fine tuning of any parameters. And so, uh, Pierre Bach introduced more than one model of self organized criticality, which generates long range correlations without fine tuning of parameters. But the most picturesque model which he made was called the Senpile model, and it was defined by him. And uh, then they studied it using numerical simulations and they got some interesting looking behavior. Mm -hmm. So, then Pierre Bach had come to Bombay mm -hmm. and given a seminar in which he described this theory of self organized criticality. And he was a bit of a showman and would uh, say that, you know, here is the theory for description of the fluctuations of water or in Nile and the brain and so on. Mm -hmm. And when we listened to him, we said, this is all nonsense. You know how it is just too, too much of tall claims and it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So, then, but we wanted to show that this does not work. Mm -hmm. So, we started looking at this work a little bit more carefully. Mm -hmm. Then at that time, we were studying directed percolation. So, we said, oh, there is a sand pile model. But in this sand pile, when there is a toppling, the sand goes equally in all directions. That does not make any sense, it should go more downward than upward. So, we made a model called directed sand pile model and it turns out that it is much easier to study and understand even in simulations than the undirected model. So, then uh, eventually with, with Ramaswamy, Ram Ramaswamy, we wrote a paper on the solution of the directed sand pile model. And then the same techniques can be extended a little bit to make it for the applicable to the case of undirected sand piles. There is some um, abelian group structure which shows up which is very nice and interesting and it was not immediately obvious. It is actually very kind can be explained to high school students now, but uh, it is not 
if you just give the definition of the model, it is not clear. So, that was not appreciated immediately by Pierbach and collaborators. So, anyways, once we got this, then we started working in the general area of self organized criticality. We studied some other models and looked at some similar behavior. In particular, we showed or we believe we showed that you can describe proportionate growth in animals using models like sand pile model. Somehow that work has not been highly influential as it is called, you know, like it has been roughly ignored. Okay. Anyway, so that is some sort of self-organized criticality. Uh, while I was going through your uh, articles, I noticed that uh, there were some articles with the title uh, "Directed Sight Animals Enumeration Problem." Seems like a curious name. So, what huh. is that? Okay. So, yeah, the name is sort of not very um, descriptive, but it turns out that the name "animal problem" was given by a mathematician called Harari. So, you have some lattice and we can take the square lattice and you have sites and there are clusters of connected neighboring sites. So, that is called an animal. The Harari's justification for calling it an animal is that uh, you know you take a chessboard and put some pieces on it which are nearest connected by nearest neighbors. You look from top. He said this looks like patterns of bacterial growth in a petri dish. So, since it is a group of cells, he called it an animal and this is an animal of size 4, if it made of 4 cells, it is an animal of size 6, it is made up of 6 cells. So, since uh, he is an influential person and of course, very deep mathematician. So, the name he gave to the subject stuck and it was called the animal problem. And uh, then we just said that we are going to study directed animals because that was at that time our life's mission was to study directed problems. So, it turns out that also for this problem for the directed property helps in the exact solution of the problem. So, we first studied it using computers. Mm -hmm. We got the series of numbers which gives the number of animals of size n. Mm -hmm. And then after staring at it for a while one could even guess the exact equation which those numbers um, satisfy mm -hmm. and then prove that result and you know and then extend it to higher dimensions and so on. Mm -hmm. So, that was the work. So, the it is animal problem and then enumeration of animals mm -hmm. and directed animals and you know the animals are called site animals or bond animals depending on the elements you look at are the number of sites or number of bonds. So, we studied the site animal problem. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that after came, after coming to TIFI, we started working on uh, dynamics in disordered spin chain. So, disorder sort of gives the impression that it has some non-systematic behavior. Uh, so, what is interesting in, or what is different huh. about dynamics in these disordered systems? Yeah. So, here the word disorder is used in a sort of jargonish sense in the sense scientists develop some shorthand for at times. So, this is actually quench disorder and uh, if you look at the properties of a system, the degrees of freedom are usually disordered like um, positions of atoms in a gas in a box. However, the Hamiltonian is very nice and well behaved, it is symmetric in under exchange of particles uh, potential energy plus kinetic energy. But if you study similar problems uh, on a lattice, um, uh, impu magnetic impurities in metals, then there are not everywhere is occupied by a magnetic atom and the interaction between atoms depends on the distance between them and it is not the same everywhere. So, this point that here the Hamiltonian has uh, is not the same everywhere is called quench disorder. So, the Hamiltonian is disordered, the degrees of freedom which are the spins on the sides they are always disordered anyway, but here the Hamiltonian is also disordered. It turns out that the properties of the system in which there is quench disorder are substantially different from systems where there is no quench disorder. And quite often the behavior is dominated by the properties of the disorder. Okay, so, not only are the properties different, they are governed by the mm, presence of disorder and not by the other part, which may be much more. So, for example, if you take ordinary metals, the 
if there was no disorder, it will have infinite conductivity. But the fact that conductivity is finite is actually due to the fact that it is not a perfect crystalline lattice and there is a disorder in it. Okay, so, that is the notion of quench disorder and uh, it has been studied quite a lot because of this and because of the fact that many experimental systems need to invoke the fact that there is disorder to determine the behavior. So, this is in some sense similar to spin glasses. Yeah. Spin glasses in a, is an example mm -hmm. of the kinds of disordered systems mm -hmm. one can study. Mm -hmm. So, talking about spin glasses, uh, this is something that I have heard in the context of uh, statistical inference. M more generally, uh, when you look at uh, ideas in, uh, uh, there are a lot of ideas that are shared between statistical inference and statistical mechanics. Interestingly, your uh, co-recipient of the Boltzmann medal is uh, John Hopfield and he is famous for his work on statistical inference or yeah. some of the early works on uh, what could be called machine learning. So, uh, what do you think is the connection between statistical mechanics and let us say cognition? And okay, so the problem of cognition is of course a very deep problem and people do not really understand it well. And uh, you can approach this problem from various angles, uh, like the psychologists would describe the problem of cognition in some way and they will write thick books about it. And uh, they will perhaps not once invoke any of the concepts statistical physicists used to describe the same problem. So, of course, you know that leads to some uh, divergence, but it also leads to richness of the description. You know, the same problem can be viewed from different angles, and each angle provides some perspective about what really happens. So, the one of the perspectives on this problem of cognition would be a physicist perspective. So, we would like to understand it as physicists understand the problem, and understanding means that you describe it in terms of things you already understand. So, the things we already understand are things like you know interacting spin systems. So, we try to describe problem of cognition in terms of interacting spin systems. So, what are these spin systems now? So, you have to identify variables and it seemed reasonable and you know, very great insight actually that one can think of neurons as having two states firing and not firing and these states will be the analogs of the discrete spin states and they will interact in some way and uh, that will lead to the behavior of these interacting degrees of freedom will can be described in terms of some Hamiltonian or update rule or whatever. And then I will try to describe memory or cognition in terms of you know what would happen to a spin system if exposed to some perturbation and so on. It's an interesting connection. Um, so uh, I was again uh, going through your articles. You know, over the years, uh, you know, of teaching statistical mechanics, I, you know, or learning uh, statistical mechanics, I've seen microcanonical ensemble, uh, canonical ensemble, grand canonical ensemble, and some of your papers, I noticed uh, this idea of pico -can canonical ensemble. Uh, what is that? Okay, so actually, the idea was not very new. The idea has been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But the name pico canonical we did invent and unfortunately it has not become very popular. So, it is not used much. We tried to make it work, but it was not accepted in general by the community. But anyway, what I what is the ensemble? So, there is a micro canonical ensemble where all states are equally likely of the same energy. And the grand the canonical ensemble is bigger in the same more states are allowed or even different energies. And the grand canonical is even bigger because you even change the number of particles. A pico canonical ensemble is smaller than a micro canonical ensemble, that is the reason for the name. And it is smaller because we want to describe things like glasses, non ergodic, non -ergodic systems. And it was realized that if you want to study properties of diamond, even not just glasses, then if you sum over all possible states, then you do not get. Um, properties of diamond. What you have to do is you have to restrict the summation over states to states which are accessible in reasonable time nearby. So, you have to restrict the set of states to a much smaller set and this smaller set in the volume is 
10 to the power minus 23 times the original set. So, it is much much smaller and so you, you know and there are many such small sets of states you can make. These are called basins of attraction of the corresponding um, free energy minima or some such thing. Okay. So, anyway, so, so there are many such uh, local uh, set of states over which you sum and you do not sum over everything. Restricted ensembles, it is the word people use now. And uh, so, that is what uh, is the notion of pico canonical ensemble. I think it is a good name, but it is not very popular. Um, so, in 2016 or uh, end of 2016, you moved to Iser Pune from TAFR. So, um, so, how was your transition from teaching in a, a graduate student research setting to an under, primarily undergraduate setting in Iser Pune? Okay, certainly it requires some uh, readjustment and learning and restructuring of brain for my part. The point is that uh, for when you are in some research institute like TFR, then we work with students, but you assign a student a problem and then he is expected to work for 7 days a week on one particular problem and you know you give him one paper then he has to read all the cited references and come back within 2 weeks. The undergraduate students they are not so focused, they will not if you expect them to be able to spend so much time on one particular problem mm -hmm. that will not be reasonable. Mm -hmm. But it took me some time to realize this mm -hmm. and so but you know they are very enthusiastic and they like to learn in lots of different things and it has been very interesting working with them. And how about the teaching aspect? Oh. The teaching I like I mean I think I am able to adjust but with a little bit of effort. I think my very interesting part was that all the faculty here was much younger than me at least 25 years younger <laughs> maybe more. And so when I came here I would go in for a morning walk and one of the people caught me and said whose daddy are you because you know they did not think that I would be a faculty member, but I would be the father of a faculty <laughs> member. A couple of years ago you wrote this article on uh, surprising effective of mathematic, effectiveness of mathematics in uh, physics and sciences. Uh, so, for someone who has uh, worked on um, somewhat mathematical side of uh, statistical physics. What made you feel that the connection was surprising? So what okay, so this word is actually not mine. It was originally chosen by Wigner. He said that the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physical sciences. Mm -hmm. And uh, so also I think other wiser people have said the most incomprehensible part about nature is that it is comprehensible. So, the fact that you know we look at everyday life and nothing kind of repeats itself and it is every everything is different if I am here it is different from if I am in um, Lakshmi Chok and that is different from Sweden and uh, time wise also it is different. So, it is very non trivial that if you look at some things like you know the interaction between two electrons at a particular distance it is the same here now as in some other place some other time. So, the fact that there are these physical so called physical laws which are same in different places at different times is not at all obvious. It does not even have to be true and people have wondered about this and so this was the question. But you know the question Wigner asked was more sort of specific the answer he gave was also specific which he said that it okay it is very surprising but it happens and it is great and uh, this particular article has been very influential it has led to a lot of thought and debate amongst philosophers of science and so on but uh, in 2006 uh, Derek Abbott from Adelaide University wrote a rejoinder he said no 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 this is not true it is science mathematics is not effective in describing physical phenomena and it is reasonable that it is not effective. So, it is high, it is not effective and you know it is reasonable that it is not effective. And so, the argument she gave was that of course, mathematics is very useful in describing some features of some systems, but these are particularly carefully chosen systems 
and for most other things it does not work. So, you only have to realize that it is working, it is working very well, but only in a very small subsection of the experience of life. So, for example, you know we are physicists, but if you watch a cricket match, then when you are watching the cricket ball being thrown, which is pretty mechanical system, I think knowledge, knowledge of laws of physics does not help much in playing cricket. Okay? So, to that degree, one would say that um, knowledge of mathematics is not useful in playing cricket or in playing politics or in going and buying shirts in the market. So, that is the sense in which one says that it is not effective. And uh, what one says uh, slightly more specific is that in mathematics one we works with very idealized constructs. So, there is a thing called perfect circle which people even in high school know. And then there are theorems about perfect circles that you know which you can prove in geometry. But as an engineer or as an experimental physicist, you will realize that there is no perfect circle anywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. okay? If you draw it by pencil, then it has some thickness and some jitter and if you can draw a finer pencil, it will still have always some thickness and some jitter. So, there is nothing called a perfect circle. So, what is the validity of the theorem? Okay? So, it works with these idealized objects and its applicability to the, to the real world is limited and to the cases where you know that is a good approximation to the system that is all that is what I have said. Uh, I think there is one quote which I can give here which is very nice I like it it is not mine it is other people, but it, you know I am picking the things to quote. So, Galileo in his book said that the nature's book is written in mathematical symbols. Okay? And uh, people realize that oh well, but you know what mathematical you know mathematical symbols are these circles and triangles and stuff, but there are no circles and triangles, they are constructs, they are constructs made by people. Because to the best of our knowledge, other animals like dogs and mm, maybe lions do not have concept of a perfect circle. This I am this I am extrapolating from known behavior, one has not made any direct study of this, but if we accept the fact that the this idea of being able to generalize to the notion of a perfect circle is made by humans, then one says that we have picked into the book of nature and it is full of our own scribblings. Okay? It is not written by God, it is written by us. The patterns we see are the patterns we can recognize which we are uh, making up ourselves in some sense, because we invent the notion of a perfect circle and then we can describe the notion of planets in terms of perfect circles. So, your take on it is that uh, the theorems and laws that we know are approximations to the real world. Yeah, idealizations of the real world, simplifications and idealization. These simplifications are very useful, mm -hmm. but you know then one should realize this and one should not uh, expect too much more. Okay, uh, thanks Deepak for a very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you.